you're an incredibly successful businessman, a philanthropist, and you're incredibly successful as a family man. And everyone here knows and is interested in what you've accomplished. But why don't you tell us, how do you, how do you define success? What does success mean to Joe Siegel? Success for me is what I feel inwardly. You know, you feel you've done the job or you haven't done the job. You feel you have completed it or you've left it incomplete. I'm not a one-man show. I have a wife. I've been married to her for 66 years. And I have to tell you, I never went to her to solicit advice. I went to her to make her be informed as to what I was going to do. And I wanted her, because she was my partner, to understand the ramifications of my success or failure. That's why we we're still together 66 years. There's been no hidden agenda. And that applies to business too. There's no hidden agenda in business. If you can't put it on the table, you're not gonna succeed. Now I have four kids, two sons, two daughters. Now when I started, they didn't exist. But then they grew, they went to school. And I had to make sure, when I got married, I said to myself, my obligation is to my wife. That's number one. Then I had children. And my responsibility was to my children. So you have to make a sacrifice in everything in life. You want to take something out of it, you put something in. And I devoted my early years to being successful because I wanted to establish an environment for my kids. And I've done pretty well. I live like a king and I'm not ashamed of it. But by the same token, what is a measurement of success? I see so many people that have nowhere to turn, no one to speak to. You know, if they need a thousand dollars and they go to the bank, the bank's not interested, it's too small. So they go to the credit union and the credit union says, do you own a house? You build a reputation, you build a business on a solid foundation. That's where it starts. You can build the most magnificent house on sand. And the water comes along and the house disappears. So if you have a solid foundation, you build your house one brick at a time. And when it's finished, it stands the test of time. It used to be, what were the three bad wolves? <laughs> but that's life. It's symbolic. So it's the same thing with the business. You build a reputation. If you're going to be building a business, you're an entrepreneur and you know, what you should have said to me is, what is an entrepreneur? And I would give you my definition of an entrepreneur. Okay. But when you build a business, it's a two-way street. You, I can't think of any business where you can be successful without relating to A, the people you do business with, and B, the people that you employ. And then, if you are cognizant of that fact, you know, this is my reach. I want to build a business. I want it to get a little bigger. I have to join hands. That's my employees. I join hands with my employees. The bigger the circle, the bigger the business. The weaker the circle, the less the business will endure. 
So you have to be sure that you build that circle with strong hands and then it will sustain and it will grow, it will flourish, flourish and grow. But then it requires leadership and you have to say, is this of yesteryear or is this of today or is it of tomorrow? Yesterday is gone, we can't recreate it. Don't live in the past, remember the past. Live in the present and look to the future. Not dream about the future, but look to the future. Then you'll be successful. And never ever worry about what you left behind. Worry about what's ahead of you. What you've got, what's ahead of you. And, then, and money is not, People have often said to me, what did you dream? What did you want to be when you were a kid? We were all kids at one time or another. You're still kids. <laughs> what did you want to do? I had that question asked a thousand times. What did you want to do? And if you don't know what you want to do, but you really want to do something, you want to be successful. All I wanted to do was be successful, whatever road that took me on. And if I was on, on a highway and I wasn't sure and I came to a fork in the road and one said Las Vegas 100A and the other said Las Vegas 100 and I wasn't sure which one and my wife would say it's 100A and I would say <laughs> I don't think it's a hundred A, eh? I think it's a hundred, but I'd take a hundred A eh? because she said so. <laughs> and I'd go down the road 10 miles and I would stop at the first service station and I would say, am I on the right road to Las Vegas? And the guy would say, yes, it'll get you there, but it's a crummy road and it'll take you half an hour longer even though it's a little shorter go back and take the other road and you'll get there a half an hour sooner on a smooth road. That's what life is. That's what business is. Everything that you do, you have to have an open mind. And you know, being obstinate, trying to prove that you were right, when you know you're wrong, that's failure. Making it right, that's success. So, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> it was about how you define success, and I think you did a beautiful job. And I think, you know, while it's hard for anyone to believe that you'd have had any failures given, given all of that, have you? I have a little... No, you know, I'm only going to talk about the ones I really remember. <laughs> I have a $2 bill sitting on my wall, a framed $2 bill. Now, I don't know how long it's been since we printed them, but this goes back. I think there's somebody in this room that worked for Robinson Ogilvy or something, somewhere. Bill, Bill Gibson. And I bought Robinson Ogilvy, which was a department store chain owned by the English, I don't know, maybe it was Liverpool or wherever. And I bought this company and I put two guys in to run it. I had bought Collegiate, Collegiate Sporting Goods, which maybe none of you are familiar with, but it's now the Forzani Group. And when I sold Zellers to the Bay, I got a phone call from Imasco. Imasco was Imperial Tobacco Company. And it was from the president. And he said, you know, you've sold Zellers now and we own a company <clears throat> called Collegiate in the sporting goods business. And he said, now that you've sold uh, Zellers, maybe you would like to buy Collegiate. And I said to him, well, I don't ski, and I don't play golf, <laughs> and I don't know anything about sporting goods. Yeah, but he said, maybe you can help us. I said, look, I'm not interested, but I'll come and look. He said, when are you coming? 
I said, tomorrow. I got on a plane and I arrived in Toronto, maybe 3.30, 4 o'clock, and they picked me up and they took me to the Bristol Hotel. There's a hotel at the airport, Bristol Hotel. And they had a couple of war rooms showing me everything about the company. And I said, look, I don't need the statistics. I want to know the nuts and bolts. And I want to see your operation. And they said, okay, are you interested? I said, yes. Now I went to their headquarters and I used to smoke cigars years ago and I love a cigar. And they, I went to the headquarters and in the back end was an office. And in this office, the door was closed and it was a haze of cigar smoke and that was the president of the company behind the closed door. And this was like a 100,000 square foot distribution center in their head office. And this president would do all his notes and provide all his direction for all of the employees for the next day. Then he would go out and he would put the directions on their desk. And this is what I want you to do. But he never had any one-to-one -one contact. There was no rapport. And the people, there was no morale. And to be successful, you need a morale. You need to keep these hands joined. You have to have people that want to be there. I bought the company. And I sold the company. I made a deal with, I bought the company. And I got a call from Provigo. I don't know whether any of you ever have heard of Provigo. And they had Sports Experts, which was in the Maritimes. And I owned Collegiate. And I had a company called Arlington in Quebec. And I got a phone call from the president of, uh, of uh, Sports Expert. He said, I want to see you. Can we talk? And I said, sure. I was commuting to Montreal, which I don't recommend for anyone. I don't mean Montreal, I mean commuting. <laughs> and I met with him, Pierre Lazard, and he looked at me and he said, you have Arlington in Quebec? We have sports experts in the East. You have collegiate in the West. Give us Arlington. Otherwise, we are going to open in the West. Now, Provigo had a lot more money than I had. You know, I was a fly speck on the balance sheet of Provigo. And I looked at him. And I said, are you asking me or are you telling me? Well, he said, you take your choice. <laughs> so I went home and I thought about it. And I needed the head office contribution from Arlington to keep Collegiate alive. You know, I bought a company that was losing their shirt and turned it around in one year from a huge loss to a million dollar profit. And I couldn't give up Arlington. But I didn't want to stay in collegiate for the rest of my life. So how do I find a solution that's going to satisfy them and satisfy me and be mutually beneficial? So I picked up the phone to him. I said, I'll make a deal with you. We'll take sports experts. We'll take collegiate. We'll merge the two. And at the end of three years, we will put a multiple on it. And at the end of three years, you can buy it at that multiple. And if 
I can't do the job and it doesn't produce a profit, you're going to get it free. And if I do a great job, you're going to pay for it. Which would you like? <laughs> and in three years, they bought me out. But I had a couple of hot shots running that company, and they were really good. So I put them into Robinson when I bought the company. And I was tired of commuting, and I didn't go to look at it very often. That's another point. Never forget, out of sight, out of mind. You own a company, you've got to manage it. So... We owned a store, an Ogilvy store in Rideau Center, and we owned the real estate. And there was a, a, another retail company that had opened, pioneered in the fashion business. They were Europeans, and they wanted to buy Ogilvy's. And this is after we'd been running Ogilvy's for a few years. And so I said, okay, and I made a deal. And I got there, and these two hotshots that I put in to run these, this company pulled me aside. And they said, you know, I think you should know we own a couple of Mercedes-Benz automobiles in the company, and we have this, and we have that, and I did this, and I did that, and they confessed, figuratively. And I said, well, does this buyer know? His name was Brennickmeyer, Derek Brennickmeyer. And they were huge people. And they said, no, that's why we're telling you. You tell them. <laughs> so I sat down with Derek and I said to Derek, you know, there's a little bit of stuff going on here that I'm not familiar with. And so you can buy the company and we'll adjust when we do an audited statement at the end of the year or, and he said, just a minute. He said, I don't want to buy the company. I was tired of commuting and I didn't know what I had. So I said to Derek, Derek, if I give you the company, will you take it free? Will you gamble? Take it free. I don't know what's there. He said, yes. <laughs> I said, well, one proviso. You bring me tomorrow a brand new $2 bill autographed by Derek Benickmeyer, and it's your company. And he brought me a $2 bill, and it's autographed, and I have it on my wall. And so whenever I plan on doing anything foolish, <laughs> I, turn, <laughs> uh, I turn and I look at this reminder, because that $2 bill cost me probably 10 or $15 million, I don't know. <laughs> so that's what it's all about. But you don't look back, you look ahead. What ahead. else? Well, so last night as I was... I don't want to bore anybody. No, oh my gosh. Is anybody bored? Are you kidding me? So, Joe, last night um, I was preparing for today and my nine-year-old daughter, Victoria, was listening and she, you know, she was asking me questions about you and reading over my notes, of course. And she, uh, she said, Mom, you haven't asked him yet which of the companies he started that he bought were his favorite. You know, children, they'd like to know your favorite. So Victoria would like to know which of your companies that you've bought over your lifetime has been your favorite? I've never had a favorite. I have one wife as my favorite. <laughs> so you run a business, everybody evolves. A business evolves, and people evolve with the business, or they don't. If you evolve with the business and you love the business and you created something, then you look for another opportunity because maybe the, you have outgrown the business. Maybe you want to move on. 
So you buy another business. And every business you fall in love with or you wouldn't buy it. It's like going out on a date. You wouldn't go if you didn't love her. So I don't, I can't say, I bought Zellers. I went to the Bank of Montreal. There's one or two bankers here today and they used to have a banker by the name of Bruce Campbell. Did you ever know him? To my banker. Now, I'm going back a lot of years. This is like 1976. And I went to my banker and I said, I want to buy Zellers. And I had tried to buy Zellers. And the brokerage, I don't think it was DS, it was Green Shields at that time. And Green Shields said to me, who are you? And I said, well, I, I, uh, I'm in the retail business. I own Fields. And he'd say, who the hell is Fields? <laughs> because Zellers had been shopped to every major retailer in the country, and nobody could understand anything. Couldn't understand Zellers. And it had been established a long time, but Zellers had become an inbred company, and they, they were a subsidiary of a company called W.T. Grant, a U.S. company that went into Chapter 11, and Zellers were next because Zellers were emulating W.T. Grant because the orders, the orders came from W.T. Grant. So I had a store, a field store in Brentwood Shopping Center. Now there's always something, an omen. There's always something that tells you something. I had a 4,000 or a 6,000 square foot store, a 6,000 square foot store in Brentwood Shopping Center. And I had tried to get into Brentwood and they said, forget it. They don't want you with a field store. It's too low end. And a month before the shopping center opened, they called me. Then they said, will you take the store? Because they couldn't lease it to anybody else. So I said, I'll take it. But you fixture it. And I'll put the merchandise in. And I'll open. And they did it. As long as I committed to open the store on time. So here I am sitting with a 6,000 foot field store doing a million dollars a year in volume. Now, you know, in those days that was 180 a foot or 200 a foot, and it was big. And next door to me is a seller store, and it's 24,000 feet, 24,000 square feet, and it's doing 400,000 a year. And I couldn't understand how they could be so bad because they're either so bad or I'm so great. <laughs> and then Zellers went into being a subsidiary. They came on the market and I tried to buy it. Nobody wanted to talk to me. And finally, when they couldn't sell it to anybody, I said, I'll buy it. And I phoned Bruce. I know I went to my banker and they phoned Bruce Campbell and he came out. He was a project guy and he came out. And I said, I'm going to need $50 million, $50 million. That was a lot of money in 1976. And they said, well, give it to you. And they gave me $50 million. But I couldn't buy Zellers without it being approved by the bankruptcy court in New York. And $50 million was the limit. If I had to pay $52 million, I wouldn't get it. I, I didn't have the money. So I got on a plane with my wife, Canadian Pacific Airlines, and it stopped in Winnipeg on its way to New York. And uh, my wife stayed on the plane. I was with my lawyer, my lawyer, my wife, and myself. And I got off the plane in Winnipeg. And I sat in the lounge. And when you get off the plane, you can't get back on until they board. You can't walk on and off the plane. So I'm sitting in this lounge, and there's a couple of guys sitting next to me. 
and they're talking. And they're talking about sellers. So my ears perked up. <laughs> and they're on their way to New York to make a bid for sellers. <laughs> and that was the president of Gambles Canada, which belonged to Gambles Scogmo of the U.S., a huge conglomerate. And they own McLeod's, and they own Marshall Wells in Canada. <clears throat> so I knew there's something going on. Anyway, we arrived in New York. We went to the courtroom. They're there, we're there. The judge says, what's your bid? What's the bid? I had $52 million or whatever, give or take 100,000. And I said 30 million. And they said 34 million. I said 35 million. They said 38 million. I said to myself, I'm running out of money fast. <laughs> so when we reached 40 million dollars, I addressed the judge. Then I said, Your Honor, I'm here to buy the company. And I'm prepared to write the check now. Can they write the check now? And the judge turned to them and said, can you write the check? They said, no, we have to have board approval. Now, you know, with a big corporation, it's got to go through the board. And so I said, they, the judge said to them, how long will that take? And they said, about a week. So the judge turned to me and he said, will you give us a week? And I said, no. He said, will you give us four days? I said, no. He said, will you give us till tomorrow? I guess, uh, so I said, I guess I have to. Now, fortunately, the chairman of the board of Campbell's Cogmo was fishing. <laughs> <laughs> so I got lucky. The judge looked at me and he said, I hope I never see you in this courtroom again. <laughs> and I got the company, I got sellers. And I was in Los Angeles. And I got on a plane from Los Angeles to fly to Montreal the day I took over sellers. And that was the night of the PQ election. Then the PQ got elected. And I said to myself, this is either the worst deal I ever made or the best deal I ever made. We're gonna see. And one thing evolved in another, and I couldn't speak a word of French, except high school French, but I went to Sellers. And you know what I did to make that company work? One simple little thing. I lifted the saran wrap and I let the company breathe because it was so inbred, so suppressed, that if the president walked by, people would stand to attention. You know, nobody could communicate with anybody and everybody was doing their own thing. Lifted the saran wrap and let the company breathe. Allowed people to be expressive. Allowed people to take initiative. Allowed people to be people, to be themselves. And that was the answer. And I took Zellers, I think you said I doubled the sales. I took Zellers from 300 million, 350 million a year, to 850 million a year in three years, never opened a new store. Never opened a new store. When I arrived on the scene, they were giving up, they couldn't make a store work. They opened a new store at 70,000 square feet. The sales weren't there because they didn't have the merchandise. They didn't understand how to merchandise it. So they'd say the store is no good. So they would give the store to Canadian Tire for $2 a foot. And Canadian Tire made the store hum. 
first thing I did, I took this store that I told you about that was next door to me in Brentwood Shopping Center, next to my field store, and I said, we're gonna have a project. We're gonna fill that store. We're gonna change the nature of that store. and We're gonna make that store hum. And we did. I said to them, I want it done. They said, okay, we'll put it on the planning board and it'll be ready and we can do that in the next year. And I said, no, this is June. It's gonna be open in September. We're gonna do it for Christmas. It's gonna get a measurement. That store in the first full year of operation did two and a half million dollars from $400,000. Was no miracle. You give the public what they want. You, you know, my wife used to say to me, I can't find anything for myself at a field store. And I would say, I'm happy. I don't need you as a customer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was. You gotta be objective. What else? We're gonna run out of time. Yeah, we're, we're doing okay. So, um, you know, Joe, we've often heard about you that you have this uncanny ability to look at a business either like through its window figure literally or figuratively and make accurate statements about their financials so when you're looking at a business what goes through your head when you're analyzing it do you look for red flags are there some key things you look for how do, how do you do that so quickly and accurately and you don't keep paper on your desk i mean like how do you do it when you look at a financial statement you don't look at it as if you're a banker. The banker wants to know what's the escape? What are the assets? What's the liquidation value? You look at a business and you say, where are the opportunities? Where can I take this business? Do they understand their market? Are they servicing their market? Are they trying to be all things to all people? You know, in the retail business, you either have margin or you have volume. Now I brought this today. And it says, rent the runway. Now are you familiar with that? Do you know what rent the runway is? I'm gonna tell you how it happened. And I read, I read everything from Women's Wear Daily to Forbes to Fortune to <laughs> Wall Street Journal to USA Today, you name it, because that's my source of knowledge, of information. So I read Women's Wear Daily, and I'm reading an article on Rent the Runway. What's Rent the Runway? You know, you put a runway up and rent it out. A couple of sisters went to visit another sister, and this other sister had a major function to go to and she didn't have a dress and this was a major catastrophe and in the process these two other sisters says you know maybe there's an opportunity there so what did they do they started rent the runway so if you are a designer and you're producing a dress that retails, and usually the special occasions require a special dress, but you don't use that dress more than twice from the time you buy it till the time you throw it away. But you want to impress. So now you're not going to go and buy a dress for $2,000 to wear one night unless one of the problems in the retail business, a woman would come in and buy it for 2000 and bring it back the day after the event and you'd give her a refund. So what is rent the runway? A host of designers, all known designers, and if a dress retails for $1,200, the wholesale cost on that dress that is 1,200 retail is maximum $480 and maybe 420. 
So these women established connections with designer labels, put an inventory together, and then on the internet reached the consumer. And so you can rent a $1,200 dress for $200. Now that dress is 1200 retail, but remember it only costs 420 and you're paying $200 to wear it once. And even if it's only worn five times, the margin is phenomenal. Now if you could rent a dress and nobody knew you rented it, and you could spend 200 or 300 or $500 to use it once, you'd rent it, as long as nobody knew it was rented. So that was an opportunity, and this thing has taken off, and it's only the last year or so. So it's an opportunity, you recognize it. That's what life is made of, recognizing opportunities. When I started in business, the only thing that I could get, the only thing that I could buy was what nobody else wanted. If nobody else wanted it, I got it, because I didn't have the money to buy what everybody else wanted. So I had to make do, and I had to be creative. Common sense. Don't have to be an inventor. Use common sense. What's the application? Where does it fit? How does it fit? Sorry. So, no, please don't be sorry. This is excellent. If you, um, if you were 24 years old again, Today, what business would you start? What would you do? I don't want to start another business. I've had my fun. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, I dream, I read. And, and sometime you read an article that is leaning one way and maybe there's another way to mold it, to create it. I could start a hundred businesses without going too far. All I gotta do is do a little reading and see, hey, have they thought, look at it this way. Have you thought of this or have you thought of that? Has anybody else thought of this? What's an app today? Some guy comes in with some goofy, ingenious, in, 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 invention, then he sells it for a billion dollars. Who wants to do that? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and what would you say, I mean, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, especially, you know, ones we've come across involved with FWE, who, you know, they're, they're working hard to build their businesses. They might not be paying themselves anything. They're having trouble making their own payroll. Cash flow is a tough thing. Uh, and they're finding it hard to justify extending their risk further. They have families to support, but they believe in their idea. So, so what, what do they do? What, what should they do? Any advice? The first thing you should do is say, I'm not going to get locked in. If it's not working, say goodbye. You start a business, you know, I know people that own a 7-Eleven franchise and they work 14 hours a day. And if they equate their salary, the value of their salary to what the business is making, all they've got is a job. Now, what's the future? So you'll do another 6% sales and you'll make another $11 a week. So there's no potential. If you have a seven, I, I have mentored a lot of young guys. And I often say, I would rather own my own hot dog stand, earning $40,000 a year, than be working for the Hudson Bay Company in some capacity earning 60,000 a year. Now, I'm going back to the days when 40 was a decent salary and, you know, 60 was huge. Why? Why would I rather earn 40 as 
a hot dog stand operator because it's my hot dog stand. But if I can't open a second hot dog stand and put my wife to work, <laughs> and then open a third one, joining those hands, connecting to the point of where I become a McDonald's in the hot dog business, that's the potential. So if I'm working for the Hudson Bay Company, I'm gonna get a 4% increase or six, or two, or nothing. And you know, big corporations used to make big mistakes. They'd establish incentives that no one could ever reach. What's the point in having an incentive that nobody ever achieves? You want people to achieve and overachieve, not underachieve. So nobody got the incentive. But when they put it into play, it was a big incentive, but unachievable. So what was the question? <laughs> no, you did, you did well. You answered it. And I, you know, I think entrepreneurs also want to know, for, for entrepreneurs, how, um, how important is it to have other people's money in, invested to, in your business or to leverage your idea versus bootstrapping and making it 100% owned by you, the entrepreneur, and keeping it all your own capital and your own sweat equity? I can answer that in a couple of different ways. Would you rather, would you rather own 10% of the Hudson Bay Company rather than 100% of a little dress shop? Obviously, 10% of the Hudson Bay Company. So it's a question of degree. Now, it also revolves around potential. We all get locked in trying to make a square peg fit a, wrong, a round hole and it doesn't work. If it's not working, it doesn't fit, move on. So what is an entrepreneur? What is an entrepreneur in your opinion? You're saying you start something, you got a dream, it's got to grow, do you give up 20%, 50%, 80%? The business, it depends on the thing. But what is an entrepreneur? What does it take to be an entrepreneur? You got to have an idea. And uh, lots of people have great ideas, but they're dreamers. They do nothing with them. So you're a dreamer. But if you have a great idea and you're a doer, then you become an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is someone that takes a conviction and makes it a reality, makes a dream a reality. Lots of people have great ideas. If I could harness a, an infinitesimal amount of dreams that have a lot of merit that can become realities, but the problem is this. It's either ambition, and they don't have the ambition to make it a dream, or it's a fear. Somebody said, you got a wife and you got kids, and you got to worry about the wife and kids. That's correct. You have a responsibility, and so you can't make the change. So, you know, you work for a corporation. I, I guess you're not all entrepreneurs here, but you want to be. So some of you work for corporations, and that's wonderful. And when you work for another corporation, for a corporation, it leads to frustration. You say to yourself, you know, I'm capable of more than this. Why am I here? But then you have that fear. I have to be here because I don't have an alternative. Or I got a wife and kids. Or I got a bank to pay or a credit card to pay or whatever it is. So there are so many extenuating circumstances that lead to a person's destiny. 
But when you're young, you can do anything you want. When you're young, you can afford to fail. When you move up that ladder, it's hard to make a change. It's hard to make a career change. It's hard to be an entrepreneur. When you're young, you can do anything you want to do. And you'll do it well. So you and Rosalie and your whole family have been so generous, such leaders in philanthropy, both municipally, provincially, federally, all around the world. And you, know, you, you lead by the things people know you do um, in, in terms of philanthropy, but perhaps most impactfully by the stories that float around about those that, that you have helped who don't make the donor board, it doesn't make the newspapers, they're the, they're the stories of, of that true charity that, that you give and those people you help. Why, why do you do that? And, and can just tell us a little bit about what motivates you in that regard, Joe. Why do you do that? If you have, if you say, but for the grace of God go I, then you do it. No one that I know of, with the odd exception, has ever given anything away that they're going to miss. Not even an old sofa. And I've told this story many times. You know, your wife wants to change the sofa. She doesn't like the color. The drapes are changed. It doesn't match. And you've got a perfectly good sofa. So what do you do with the sofa? You put it in the basement. <laughs> but you know your neighbor hasn't got a sofa. And this one sits in the basement. And 10 years later, you say, I've got to get rid of this damn thing. It's in the way. And so you pay to get rid of it. Instead of giving it to somebody that can use it. You don't need it, let somebody else have it. If they can use it, if they want it. So giving is not the pack, plaque on the wall. Giving is not the recognition. You do that because you're part of a community and because you want to be uh, part of that community and uh, to a degree everybody has a little ego and they like a little acknowledgement. That's what drives the human nature. But if somebody has nowhere to turn, no way of helping themselves, then you do that. That's a non-deductible donation that gives you more pleasure than that major donation to an accredited organization. And I'm going to tell you, I have four kids, I said so earlier. My four kids believe in that philosophy. That is important. And it doesn't matter what you say, it's what you do that counts. And everybody says, well, I've been so generous, I've done this, I've done that, I've supported this uh, institution and that institution. What happens if somebody can't pay their rent? What happens if somebody has nothing to eat? And I'm not talking about Africa or the disenfranchised countries of the world. I'm talking about right here in the city of Vancouver, around the corner. And just taking our waste, and instead of being wasteful, understanding that will fill the gap. We, we, we live in a community. We have a responsibility to a community. And I got to tell you, I have been more fortunate 
I made more money, then money is not the measurement. Money is only a commodity. I mean, I used to, when I arrived on the scene at Zeller's, and they couldn't understand why the hell would you worry about this or worry about that, it's only pennies. And I said to them, this is a big organization. And I take a hundred dollar bill out, then I drop it on the floor. Did you pick that up? Of course I'd pick it up. If I saw a hundred dollar bill on the floor, wouldn't I bend over to pick it up? Of course I would. Then why don't you turn the lights off if there's nobody there? Why don't you take care of the waste? And they got the message. But it took a long time. So going back to charity, I don't think anybody in this room would miss $50. I'm not going to ask you for it. <laughs> but just imagine what you can do with $50. So my wife taught me a lot. We would walk down Robson Street, and I've said this story many times, and he got a lot of people there. And this guy says, well, I've got to look after my wife and my kids. Then that guy says, I have no place to sleep, and so on and so forth. And I would say to her, forget it. They're all drugs or alcohol or whatever it is. Forget it. You're wasting your money. And she would say, there are 10, maybe Maybe two are worthy. Now you say, do you pass the two because of the ten? Or do you give to the ten for the two? That's a choice. Now if you can do it, you should do it. If you can't do it, you're obviously not going to do it. So that's life. And the more you give, you know, the old saying, the more you give, the more you get. It's true. You can go back to all of the old sayings, the old adages, and they all are really true. There's a reason for them. You have to apply them in the right manner, and then you'll understand. We have a question from D from TELUS asking, how important in your experience is putting the customer first? Always. Without the customer, you don't have a business. I can think that I, I, I used to be a buyer. I was the janitor, I was the buyer, I was the candlestick maker <laughs> in my business. And I never bought, and this was the problem. I used to have buyers and it took me ages to educate them. And I would say to them, don't buy what you like. Buy what you think the customer is going to like. Because what you like, you're not the customer. So you place yourself in the position of your customer. What are the, what are the demographics or whatever you want to call it of your clientele, your customers? The customer is always right. Even though they're wrong, they're still right. And the reason for that, you will spend millions of dollars advertising to create goodwill and one little mistake. And it's amazing what word of mouth will do to destruct the million dollars you spend on advertising. Customer is always number one. And how do you handle a negotiation? I mean, what, do you have any advice for everybody in terms of a way that entrepreneurs in particular can have a successful negotiation? Everything in life is a two-way street, even business. The deal is not the final. You can make a great deal, and you can go away and say, I did a great deal. But you gotta understand how the other guy feels. And then you wanna make another deal. And then another one, another one, you're in business, and it continues. You have to be 
you have to leave something on the table. It's got to be a fair deal. You can deal with a banker. And if he's charging you a point more than he knows he should, you're going to go to another banker. But if you have a banker that understands and says, this is the best I can do, then you understand. So when you make a deal, you take what you need, but you leave a little on the table so that everybody has a good taste. And that's important. Your reputation, when you're fo when you're building a business, when you're doing business, your reputation is of prime importance. You don't have a reputation, you're worried. If you're going to do business with someone that you can't rely on, you say to yourself, well, can I really trust him? Or somebody has something they want to sell, but they don't go to you because they feel you're never going to pay the price, even though you might. So they're going to go to somebody else. You want to be first on the list when it comes to communication, when it comes to relationships, first on the list. That's why you leave something on the table. I used to, when I was a retailer, and you're not gonna understand, well, you'll understand it, but you won't believe it. When I started in business, I couldn't pay my bills. You know, and I was, the first line of credit I ever had with a bank was $5,000, and I had to beg to get that. It was the Royal Bank. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't pay my bills. So if I owed a supplier $40,000, I would send him a check for $20,000 and a note that I can't pay you the 40, here's the 20, and you'll get the other 20 in 30 days or 60 days or whatever it was. And they appreciated that. And as long as you kept your supplier informed, and so no one ever said to me, I'm not gonna ship you because you don't pay your bills. Or I'd send them a post-dated check. What was the net result? Some of these very suppliers that got into trouble, that had to pay the bank, came to me. And they said, I'll sell you this for $10. And I would say, no. I can pay you 15. And I'd pay the 15. Because when I owed them 50,000, they carried me. And they were desperate. And if they went to the Hudson Bay Company, the Bay wouldn't buy it at any price. Or if they went to the Army Navy, they'd pay them $2. Jackie, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so if I could sell that item in those days for $30, I could afford to pay 15. And I paid them 15. And the next time, if they had something, they came to me first. That's important. That's the relationship that you build. No matter what it is, it's the same as life. You build relationships with your wife, with your family, with your husband, with your banker. Relationships. So before we take um, a, a few of our last questions here, I'm going to mix it up with kind of a, a fun question from one of our entrepreneurs, Corinne Kessel, with Greenscape Design. She says, Joe, if you could be a superhero, what would you pick as your superpower? As my super superpower. Power? I don't know. I'm happy. <laughs> you know? So if you're happy, if you're happy, you're fulfilled. You don't need any miracles. You don't need, if you're inwardly happy, you have everything. Now, we all try to improve materially, 
We all want to be successful. Everybody wants to be successful. If you want to achieve, you have to work. If you want to receive, you have to give. There's a balance in life. Now I can say that I have everything that I need because I've achieved what I want with my life. Now, my family and my children and grandchildren, that's my concern, not myself. But I never ever, going through life, ever looked back. I always remembered the past. I always remembered that $2 bill, figuratively speaking because there were many $2 bills, and I don't mean monetary losses, but bad judgments and so on and so forth through life. Those are the $2 bills that are on my wall. I always remember them. But you have to understand why. You made a mistake, why? Not to condemn yourself that I shouldn't have made it. Why did I make it? because I didn't think of this, or I didn't think of that, or I should have done this, or I should have thought of that. That's education. You learn from that mistake, and you move on. And you gotta be happy. Happiness is the one thing that not everyone achieves. I've achieved it, I'm happy. I look at gorgeous women, I have a... <laughs> And Joe, i <I'll>, <laughs> <laughs> And a, a lot of the questions coming forward are to do with what you're doing now. Can you, I mean, you're, you look an unbelievable. You're 89 years old. Gonna That's on the 90. internet, so yeah. <laughs> and so what excites you now in business? What, what are you doing? What kind of deals are you working on right now? The fact that I'm 89 has not changed the attitude. And you know, um, what is there that is exciting? So, my children will do things and they will make deals and they will accomplish. And from my perspective, I have to provide some, what's the right word, you know, things don't keep going straight up. There's always a leveling or a correction. You know, I think I said to you over lunch one day, business and life is like a journey. You know, Peter Legg is here with the runway of life, and that's what life is all about. God puts you on the runway when you're born, takes you off the runway when you die. What you do with the runway is up to you, not God. Some people have a longer runway, some people have a shorter runway. You're going to Hawaii. The aircraft has to ascend, then it cruises. Then it descends. It's got to come down sometime. Now it's a question, and that's what life is all about. You're ascending, you're cruising, and then you're descending at different stages of your life. So I told you that I read. I'll tell you what I read. I read BC Business First. Did you hear me, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> I read the Wall Street Journal. I read USA Today. I read the Financial Times. I read the Sun. I read the Province. I read the Globe. I read the National. I read Forbes. I read Fortune. I read uh, Bloomberg's. Now that's a lot of reading. But you learn so much by reading 
the other person's adventures. You know, I looked at, um, I think it was Bloomberg this morning, and I saw a distorted Coca-Cola bottle on the front, bulged. And that Coca-Cola bottle was symbolic of a stomach. And so what is the problem? Because now everyone thinks that sugar is the worst thing in the world, that sugar is the new nicotine. So Coca-Cola is bulging the bottle. And they have to find the answer to maintain their market share. Now, if you like Coca-Cola with sugar in it, you're going to buy Coca-Cola with sugar in it. But what happens now is that they give you a guilt complex. So the price of sugar will come down, and the price of uh, Rogers or whatever it is, BC sugar, will come down. And then it'll go through a cycle. And then Coca-Cola will have to find an answer to a drink that gives you the same desire, that creates the same desire as the one they have now. Otherwise, Coca-Cola is going to slip. And then Buffett is going to be concerned about Coca-Cola. But he's got money invested in Burger King and now Tim Hortons. So what is that merger? Where does that lead? Do you ever think about it? It's a franchise business, Tim Hortons. $13 billion. So what's going to happen? Burger King has never been able to reach the pinnacle in the fast food business. It's been McDonald's and Subway happens to be an organization that has grown from nothing to the second biggest overnight. Why? Has anybody ever had a Subway sandwich? It's not bad if there's nothing else. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put one more question to you before we close, and there are many more questions. So all of the, you who have put questions forward that didn't get asked, please feel free to come on up. At, you know, as Joe makes his way out at the end of this, but. Joe, I want to put one more question to you. Um, you've, you've had so much success and you've done so many things for so many people, yet we're here today and your family, I mean, all four of your kids are there in the back of the room, here and right here. And obviously family is so important to all of you. So just maybe you could just tell us a moment, your, your view on family, what your family means to you and any advice you have for everybody in the room here regarding a family so near and dear to your heart? What do you want me to say? <laughs> family is the most important thing. You know, you measure your wealth in so many different ways. You measure your wealth by A, your health, B, your family, and C, your fortune, whatever that fortune may be. Money is a commodity. It comes and it goes. It's there to accomplish something to buy something. If you had a million dollars in cash sitting under your mattress, what would it do for you? It'd make your mattress firmer, that's all. <laughs> so money is to be used. But the most important asset that anyone has is family. Blood, they say, is thicker than water. That's the expression. Have you ever heard it? Well, it's true. That's the way it is. You have a sister, 
you have a brother, you have a son. The feeling, the responsibility, the relationship. One of the things that I regret in my life is the simple fact that I never had the opportunity to spend enough time with my kids. I should have, but I couldn't. I was busy trying to provide for my kids rather than take them to the, by the hand to the park or to the zoo or whatever the hell it was. I was busy trying to run a store or whatever. But I was fortunate. I had a partner, and my partner was my wife, not in my business. My partner was, in, was my wife. So the hole that I left, she filled. So she never ever said to my kids, if they broke a light fixture, tossing a ball around, wait till your daddy comes home, he's gonna whack you across the ass. She herself did the discipline there at the time. <laughs> One of my professions that I was never good at was a stand-up comedian. <laughs> Well, I think you're pretty good at that, too. We can throw that on the resume, stand-up comedian. Uh, well, listen, I, I think everybody here can join me in a huge round of applause for what an amazing dialogue this has been with you.